and welcome to another Fibre Laser Learning Lab. As you can probably see, we're not in the workshop today. Um, I'm in my wife's laboratory. Well, let's put it this way. She's on holiday at the moment and she doesn't know anything about this. I've got one of her prized possessions here, which is her gin glass, and I've filled it full of cooking oil. Now we'll come on to this in a minute, but today's session is all about light. This is the stuff that we're firing at our materials. The laser is a beam of light, and I've told you that many times before. But the light is in a special form. First of all, all the light particles are traveling together, which makes it a coherent beam. They're all of the same color, which makes it monochromatic. Those are the two definitions of a laser beam, a beam of energy, which when it hits a surface, can interact with that surface in one of several ways. One of the first ways is it can be reflected, in which case that material is great for making mirrors. In the second instance, the light can actually pass right through the material, and such materials are great for making lenses. And then there's everything else. Now, everything else will absorb energy to a greater or lesser extent. I'm using the word absorb. That's really the wrong way to describe the way that light interacts with the material. When the light hits the material, it has energy, just like a stone falling out the sky. It's completely harmless. It has energy, but you have no idea that it has energy until it hits you on the head. And then you can feel the energy that that stone had. There's an energy conversion from kinetic energy into something that has damaged your head. The same applies to light. Only when it hits a surface does it become converted into something else. And the converting into something else is basically heat. I've got some very crude models of atoms. Now these, these little plastic pieces that I've got between those um, atoms, and these are different atoms, and they, they will each have a different length and a different strength of bond between the relative atoms and they will stay certain distances apart. So this is not untypical of a molecule but as you can see it's quite a floppy molecule. Okay, It wobbles. It wobbles nicely at that frequency. Now if I take this molecule which is typical of water, 1H and two O's, H2O. Yeah, it, it, it is a little bit wobbly, but it's not as wobbly as this one at that frequency. This one, who knows what that is? That's very, very stiff. It's got very short, stiff connections between the atoms. That one is going to be very difficult to make it vibrate. Here we've got some others. Look, they're, they're bonded in such a way that they'd be virtually impossible at that frequency to move. Here we've got yet another one. This is an invention of mine, I think, but you know, who knows? Um, maybe Ribena looks like that. Now this is the electromagnetic spectrum, which is covering anything from what we see in the middle here. This is the color range that our eyes can see because our eyes are sensitive to this particular vibration, this particular wavelength of light. And the light hitting our eyeball stimulates the molecules in the back of our eye in different ways, different frequencies, so that we can see all these different colours. Now this picture here gives us an impression of the different wavelengths of light. As we're up here at the radio end of the spectrum, we've got very long wavelengths. We can sit by our radio, we don't get any physical damage, apart maybe for ears if we have it too loud. Um, then we get to our microwave. Well, I don't think I'd want to put my hand in a microwave. Um, here we've got infrared, which is basically heat. And then we've got ultraviolet, which is sunburn. Then we've got x-rays, which are dangerous if you put too many of those into your body. And then we've got gamma rays, which are pretty dangerous if you want to um, go out into space and uh, get fried. And these are all types of light. And the way that I've described them, I'm describing the way that the light affects us, our skin, our molecules in our body. Now, not everything is going to work the same way as our body. 
I mean, if I fire gamma rays at water, I don't know what happens. But it certainly won't be the same. It won't cause the same amount of damage to water as it will do to us. When you've got a molecule, which is made up of different atoms, and they're all joined together, like this, with various types of bonding, this molecule has a certain, what we call, resonant frequency. I have spoken before about the definition of temperature. Everything you see when you look around you might look solid. First of all, it's like this, and it's mainly nothing. And secondly, it's not, as you can see, stable, sitting here doing nothing. Even the, even the molecules in this paper are busy doing this. They're vibrating. There is something in this universe called absolute zero. Minus 273 degrees C. And at minus 273 degrees C, everything stops. All molecular motion ceases. So therefore, as you start raising the temperature up towards room temperature, the vibration of molecules gradually increases. And so therefore, at room temperature, a molecule might be doing this. If we raise it up to 1000 degrees C, it's doing that. It's vibrating a lot more. So the, the amount of vibration in a molecule is a measure of its temperature. So when we turn that on its head and say, if we can fire light at this molecule and make it vibrate faster, we're actually going to make it hotter. And that is the principle by which our laser machine works. We're firing light at molecules and making them vibrate more. And because, look, we've got all these different shapes of molecules which do and do not vibrate as easily. I mean, for instance, this one may vibrate at a completely different frequency because it's a very stiff mechanism. This one vibrates mm, reasonably OK at moderate vibrations. And something like this vibrates a lot at very low frequency. You start making this go at high frequency, and it will vibrate, but it won't vibrate very much. Now, I hope I'm going to be able to give you a demonstration of the way in which different frequencies of, and I'm going to have to use mechanical frequencies as opposed to light frequencies, to convert this whole idea back into something that you can see. You can hear that low frequency, and you can see the pattern that's developing on the surface of the material. Relatively low frequency, we're getting quite a lot of movement in that oil. Even higher frequency. And we're now to a point where we've virtually got no movement at all. Now I'm purposely not taking the glass down very low because in case you think that it's all to do with the, uh, the, the vibration off the side of the glass. But it is that movement that's inducing the waves into here. That's why I'm trying to keep the, um, the level in this sort of area here, where roughly the vibration of the side is about the same. What I'm trying to show you is that the density of that fluid is such that it will only basically accept waves of a certain frequency. No, that's not gin in there. That's just ordinary water. So, yes, I've washed the glass out and hopefully my wife will never notice the taste of the soap or the oil. And we're going to do the same thing again. We've got a much less viscous fluid, which moves around a lot easier. I suppose technically it's a bit like this one. It moves around a lot easier. And this time I'm letting you look down on top of the glass because <laughs> It's so much easier to see what's going on. Now I'm holding the stem so that I don't get vibrations up through the stem itself. But look, you can see how much more energy is being absorbed by the water this time. It's going into pretty serious vibration. Okay, so let's, let's run it at high frequency. And you'll see that water still reacts quite violently, even at high frequency. We've still got our 
wave around the outside and we've got lots of surface disturbance as well. Water has a very wide range of frequency absorption capability, whereas oil does not. And I'm using this very crude analog to try and indicate to you that's why some materials absorb light and get stimulated by it. The molecules are stimulated by certain frequencies of light and they can therefore heat up. Either the light will pass through the structure relatively unimpeded because there is a great deal of nothing in most of the materials that you see around you despite the fact them looking solid. The message that I'm trying to get over to you is that different frequencies of light will have different effects on different molecular structures. Certain frequency will stimulate this to a great deal of vibration. More vibration means more heat. More heat means that this material will reach a critical point where it will do something. If it was water and it got to 100 degrees C, it would turn into steam. If it's paper and it reaches 250 to 300 degrees C, it'll burst into flame. One of them is a change and the other one's a chemical reaction, but they're still based on the fact that you're reaching, you're stimulating the molecule up to a certain temperature. And once you've stimulated the molecule to a critical temperature, it cannot exist in that molecular form. It will change to something else, as we talked about in an earlier session. I'll put that back beside its cousin, the wine glass, and provided you don't split on me, She'll never know any different. Okay, now here we've got five different metals. We'll first of all use something that we're familiar with, which is stainless steel, because we've been marking that just recently. And I will set that up to take a black mark. Well, we can see how much energy there was going into that surface. Let's see what happens when we try it with a piece of brass. Still quite a lot of power going into the surface. You can hear it and see it. Aluminium. Copper. Wow, very, very quiet. And finally, a piece of mild steel. So I think that probably demonstrates to you that all metals are not the same. They all are absorbing the energy in a completely different way, depending on their uh, atomic and molecular structure. Right, <clears throat> well, here we are in the daylight so that we can see clearly what's going on. Stainless steel, durable and black, which is how I set the machine up. Mild steel? Not bad. I don't know why you'd want to mark mild steel because you've basically got to paint it. It'll go rusty. Not a lot of functional use. Aluminium? Well, it looks to be a bit white. You can rub it and it sort of turns a dark grey. So I suppose it is a convenient way of marking raw aluminium. Yeah, well, it's, it's marking the surface. This is interesting. Copper. Now, it looks as though it's white. Is it? Well, yeah, it actually is white. That's a selection of metals. 
let's try one or two other things, should we? OK, now I'm not going to change the settings. I'm going to leave the metal settings there, which you know there's a lot of power there because it can, you know, it can burn its way into metal. So, MDF, from all accounts, wood products are not affected by one micron wavelength light. So, are we expecting this to be cut or not? Is it wood or is it not wood? There's wood in it, but there's a binder. And the binder is plastic. Do we think the plastic is going to burn and the wood not? Interesting question. Let's find out, shall we? Let's press the button and go. Well, it's having an attempt. It's got a little bit of spark, a little bit of smoke. Not exactly doing a lot, is it? That's just as the science predicted. Now here we've got a piece of 10 millimeter thick poplar plywood, I think. This is a totally organic material with no man-made materials. According to the science, this should not have any effect at all. You can see a little teeny weeny little glitter on the surface there. Nothing. Now we know that glass is not affected because we've already tried this in a previous experiment. This is what happens with a CO2 laser on the surface. We can etch on the surface. Here's what happened when we tried to etch through glass onto a piece of material underneath. It went straight through the glass, but the material underneath was aluminium. And because I was touching the aluminium at the time, this laid directly on the surface of the aluminium, look, we have actually created a mark on the back of the glass. It's a durable mark, it's not going to come off, which leaves us thinking about another possibility. Although glass transmits, looks like 100% of the wavelength of light, totally unaffected, the material underneath is not. So let's try this. So here's what we've just marked, using exactly the same settings as this. What I've done, I've put a piece of glass over the top of it this time. I'll do it in the middle so that the glass is sitting nice and flat on the material there. <laughs> well, the aluminium is no longer white. It's, um, it's quite a deep groove. difficult to say what that is. I don't know whether that's a metal transfer onto the back there. In other words, whether we vaporise the material and deposit it on the glass. It certainly looks that way because now that I've scratched the back, look, I can scratch some of the material off. So I've definitely vaporised the material and put it onto the back of the glass. But at the same time, I've done quite a lot of damage to the back of the glass as well, so there must be a, quite a large amount of heat that's taken place there. Now some of it has bonded on. As I said, some of it I can scrape off. Interesting phenomena. Let's try the same thing with copper. See, we're getting sparks on top of the glass, which is interesting because the surface of the glass has not been damaged. Wow, now that is pretty, isn't it? How durable is that, I wonder? <laughs> Very durable. OK, let's try brass. Now remember, I'm not changing any of the settings. These are all done with the one setting that we started out with. I can see that that is not going to be, whoops, I can see that that's not going to be as durable because as I catch it in the light you, you can see you can see the places where it hasn't bonded properly. It's actually quite a nice effect. I would just lightly clean that with a little industrial scouring pad. Just very lightly. I don't want to damage the glass. The 
The brass has come out quite nice on this side. The copper is perfect. We'll now do stainless steel. I suspect this is going to make a bit of a mess because we had a, a large amount of uh, um, flaming splurge on this one, if you remember. Oh, OK. Well, I have to say, that's a real surprise. Look at that. That is, it's got a lovely silver outline around it, but this is the back side. Again, I'll just, just lightly scrub over the back of that with this industrial embrace, with this abrasive pad. It's certainly durable. There's no point in trying mild steel because if I, if I try and put mild steel on there, it's only going to go rusty. Okay, now we're going to try a completely different group of materials. This is, uh, I think, a real granite. There's a chance it might be um, man-made, but I think this one, looking at the way the break shows streaks rather than little spots, I think this might be um, a real piece of granite. So let's give this a try. Well, that's done a pretty durable job of marking that. I have to say, that's not bad at all. Now I know that this is a piece of man-made marble. It's, it's a quartz material which has been bound together with a binder of some sort, uh, probably a, a, an epoxy binder. So we'll give this a try and see what happens. Mm, completely different. Catch it in the light right and there's just a hint of a mark on the surface. Maybe with some adjustment, we might be able to get that to a better cut with a different pulse width. But that's not the purpose of this exercise. The purpose of this exercise is to show you that with the same power and the same settings, various materials absorb the energy in a completely different way. Now, this is something I used on the CO2 laser and it's called a laser tile. And it's specifically designed for, I think it's a bit like a biscuit that's been cooked first and then that, that's why it's got a white glaze on it. But then when you are subjected to really intense heat, you can actually bring out the second phase of kiln glazing. Well, that's not bad. It's taken the surface off. It hasn't actually done what the CO2 laser does, which is to turn the background, which is to turn the glaze black. But that again could be just settings because I've got a lot of power going into this and I've actually taken the surface off of the glaze. And now for a piece of slate. <laughs> Well, that worked just as well as the CO2 laser. Here we've got a piece of material called Parapan. This is just a colour filled acrylic resin. Now, normally it would go straight through acrylic. It's totally unaffected. But because this has got colour on it, the dye will actually react with the light and cause a heating effect. So let's give this a try. Well, it has left a mark. It has just eaten into the surface, maybe 10 microns. Caused a small amount of discoloration. Not impressive, but at least it shows that you can work with acrylic, provided it's got colour in it. And what we could do, we could just quickly verify that. I'll find a piece of and white. If you acrylic. watch there, watch here carefully, you'll see the height change when I select the um, the red mark. There we go. So, just to assure you that I am changing the focus. It is doing something. There we go. <laughs> it's done absolutely nothing. I have to assume that this power pan has got something more than a die in it. It might have some filler in it as well. It doesn't feel heavy. 
What else have we got to try? Well, we've got this material here, which I'm told can be marked, but maybe not at these values, but we'll give it a try. This is polycarbonate. Well, that was a bit unexpected. Right, so here we are out in the daylight to have a look at this. This is quite an interesting effect. I mean, first of all, it's turned black, which is not what I was expecting. Um, but secondly, it is raised by probably as much as nearly a millimetre. It's a very interesting effect. It's bubbled up the surface, I presume, and created extra volume. I could imagine that would be very useful. This is a polypropylene cap off the end of a tube. Um, it's just a piece of plastic that I happen to have. Now, I'm always cautious about messing around with plastic, especially soft plastics like this that will melt. Um, it's going, I'm fairly confident it's going to produce some fumes, but from previous experience, we should be able to watch here in the open because although this is open, it's quite a nice extractor system here and it's pulling the air in very nicely and we should see the fumes drawing back. I've also had to change the settings for this quite dramatically from those that we used for our first wow um, because it was basically just melting it and I don't want it to melt as such. So now we've gone to 2000 millimetres a second, 100% power, we're still using 2 nanosecond pulse width but this time I think we're using 0.03, 30 micron spacing, line pitch. So there we go. Now if you've forgotten to mould that into your plastic cap or you want to put your own trademark on it or something, then yeah, you can mess around with polypropylene, but mm, it's not pretty, it's okay. A few sessions ago, I did the impossible and engraved on a piece of soft wood. I did promise that at an appropriate point in time, like now, while we're busy investigating the whole of this subject of materials and how you mark them and how well they mark, that I would bring this up and tell you exactly how I did it. It's both a simple and a complex process. So let me just go through roughly how I got to this stage. In a previous session, you've seen me black marking anodized aluminium. And at that time, I discovered that one of the chemicals that they use in the sealing process for anodizing was a material called nickel acetate. As I was, as I was using this material and realized what it was doing, it was only skin deep, and that I was converting this nickel acetate into a nickel oxide, which is black, I thought to myself, hey, if I paint that onto a piece of wood, would I be able to do the same with wood that I can do with anodized aluminium? And that's where the idea came from. It took something like about a month for this stuff to arrive from Poland. I bought it on eBay and yeah, it was, I've got, I've got about a hundred grams there, which cost about 14 pounds. hundred grams is, is a lot because all I've done, I've mixed up a very small amount into a solution there. We're going to paint some of that on a piece of wood. Now, I wouldn't advise you get this on your fingers because it does claim on the packet that it's both dangerous, carcinogenic, poisonous, uh, anything else you like to imagine which is dangerous. It's got it. Okay, so having painted one layer on, I'm now going to use my heat gun and very quickly just dry it off and basically force it into the surface because it's a fairly open grained wood this. Okay. 
So now the wood is warm and damp, it's going to take another coat easily. Just a thin coat. And we do the same again. And from experience, I found that I needed three coats. As you can see, it's not exactly taking a long time to prepare this, but it does require the three coats. Okay, so I'm going to mark that one up as A. Now I'm going to take another piece of wood and this time I'm going to put solution A. Here we've got an A solution, which is a different chemical. We'll do exactly the same treatment on it. I'm going to remark that oops, as chemical B. B. Then we've got one final chemical to try, and let's call that one C. And we'll just do the same process with this one three coats. Now, while I was playing with my heat gun, I discovered something else. And that's this. If I heat this raw material up, if you watch very carefully, you'll see the surface beginning to change colour. Forget about that brown mark on there, that's some residue from somewhere else. It's just beginning to come in now, look, I'm scorching the surface. Just being careful about that. It's subtle. But you can probably see, look, I've just changed the colour of the surface. That was quite an interesting discovery because it maybe tells me how and why what we're going to see is actually happening. The only one of these that I've tried before is A. And that's the one that I demonstrated to you. But there's a good reason why I didn't want to go ahead and tell you all about A to start with, because excited as I was at finding A, I felt there were other opportunities that were actually better than A. When I demonstrated wood engraving before, um, I had a particular set of settings. And what we'll do, we'll see how these settings work on plain wood. You can see that it is uh, singularly unsuccessful. Now we'll try the same settings on the scorched side of the wood. Well, We've got a little bit of definition there. You can't see that probably, but I can just see a bit of definition there. But I think I can improve that. Well, 
Well, it's not brilliant, but it's marking. So let's go a little bit further with my setting. And now I've overdone it. There's a bit more power in there now. Right, now I'm going to stop at that point because you can see that it's a little bit of a fiddly, delicate balancing exercise. Basically, what I've discovered here is that if you can remove the cellulose from the surface, and basically by heating the surface up, what I'd done was destroyed the, a lot of the cellulose in the surface and left quite a lot of the lignin in the wood coming up to the surface there, which is what the brown stuff is. Now, by having the lignin on the surface, the lignin actually absorbs some of the light energy. And as soon as you can start to absorb some of the light energy, you start going into a burn mode within the wood. And as soon as you burn the wood, look what we've got here. We've got carbon. And as soon as you've got carbon, you have like massive absorption of the light energy. It's very difficult to get a balance between just breaking through and getting a burn and then like this we've got a lot of carbon here if I'd have let that burn more we could I could probably burn right the way through this material once we get the burn going it's great we're going to try now the nickel acetate which is the demonstration that I performed earlier hopefully if this is a consistent process it will work just as well as it did the first time so here we go It's not the strongest black, but I could probably get a little bit darker by changing the settings. This is not as dark as these. This is carbon, right? and it's out of control. This is not carbon. This is a modification of the chemical that I painted into the surface and it only goes as deep as the chemical is penetrated into the surface. So when I change from 80 microns, 70 to 60 micron line spacing in my hatching, it doesn't change the colour. But my only problem with this is it's not a very nice chemical. It's dangerous. It's poisonous. And you couldn't really paint this onto something and sell it as a product unless you coated it afterwards with a varnish or something like that. So because it's a not a very nice chemical, so I'm not going to advise you use it to colour engrave wood. I've started to look around for viable alternatives. I have not tested any of these alternatives until now. So what we're going to do now is first time testing. Because these are different chemicals that I've painted onto the surface, in the same way that all metals are not the same, all chemicals are not the same. So we shall have to fiddle around to try and get the best parameter settings, if we can find parameter settings at all. And we'll see what we get. So side by side, that produces a darker result than this one. And they're both metal salts. This one is a sodium salt, and this one is a nickel salt. Hmm. But this one's not dangerous, because you put that in food. That's baking soda. This one, well, yeah, great idea, but I think we're gonna to have to push that down the list now. Okay. Let's try surface treatment C. Right, 
Oh, that was a little fierce. I think we could probably, we've produced lots of smoke there. I think we might be able to tune that one up a little bit. That's the way in which I have discovered we can engrave on wood. You need to treat the surface. Now, there are many other things that we could try, like I could wax the surface, I could paint the surface with a spray. There are all sorts of other opportunities that you've got now that you've got the idea. But having seen all the things that I've tested, what we need to remember is that when I turn these over and we take a look at the successful results, a metal salt, a metal salt, a metal salt. Both of these are sodium and this one is nickel. Now, there may be other salts that you could use. These two we know to be very safe. And the better one of the two turns out to be the safest one of the lot. Now, having said safe, I would caution. I would still make sure you use your extraction because sodium chloride, the chlorine element of it, worries me a little bit. I'm not a chemist, um, as I've told you many times before. So this may well be producing some nasty chlorine fumes when it gets burnt. I shall have to do more investigation on that. And that still leaves us with this one, which is a carbon sodium carbonate. It's a bicarbonate but it's still sodium and carbon. This one may eventually be the safest one to use even though this one may be the best one to use in terms of colour density. So here are the parameters for each of these. I'm not going to show you the one for the nickel acetate because as I said I think that that is potentially a dangerous chemical. Now one further thing before I go that I've almost forgotten to show you. MDF. Okay, now, MDF is not a wood. It's not a piece of material that requires any treatment at all. You need to be careful with MDF when you burn it or cut it as we found out from our CO2 laser days because it does produce a formaldehyde gas so you need to make sure your extraction is good. We don't have to fiddle with too much really nasty debris because we're not cutting, we're only just marking the surface. But let's just test it and I'll show you what the parameters are. There we go. Now, that is absolutely a superb mark. And we don't need to do anything to the surface of that material at all. All you need is the right parameter settings. Now, I've got a very small block of acrylic here, which has happened to be something that I cut out on my CO2 laser because it's got nice polished edges on it. And we're just going to do this little experiment, which I think will probably be worth looking at closer in the future. We've already seen in this video that you can't mark clear acrylic. In fact, you can't mark acrylic, acrylic at all unless it's got some sort of substance inside it which will absorb the energy. So the light passes right through this stuff. Let's have a look to see if, again, we can do something that would appear to be impossible. Looking at my black background is not very interesting, is it? But um, this might be more interesting. Sure, it was me that said you can't do anything with acrylic, wasn't it? If I shine the light across the surface there, there's no damage to the surface on either side.
all the damages within. Pretty impressive, hey? <laughs> now the main purpose of today was to show you some of the strange properties of one micron wavelength light. They're completely different to the properties that we've seen with the 10.6 micron wavelength light from the CO2 laser. Along the way, we've seen and discovered several very interesting processes that we need to investigate a lot further in the future. I'm quite excited about some of the things that we might be able to do with this machine. Thank you very much for your time again, and I will catch up with you in the next session. Bye for now.